All right, so we're looking here at 6.4, and this is one of the uses that we would have for uh, well different things. We'll we'll just look at it as we go go through here. All right, now the number of bighorn sheep in a population increases at a rate that's proportional to the number of sheep present, at least for a while. Now the reason why is because well, as you know, it takes two to tango. So you have the number of sheep that you have is going to allow for a certain number of sheep to be born and raised to, a, to an extent where you're going to hit a level, which is called the carrying capacity, that the, the area that they live on can support. There's only enough food and water and, and area to support a certain number of sheep. So if they continue to grow without any any uh, predators or anything like that, they'll hit they'll hit that carrying capacity, and it'll the population will stop growing simply because the area or they'll expand out into a larger area. One of the two. Same thing's true for any population of living creatures. Other things that increase or decrease at a rate proportional to the amount present include radioactive material. Uh, and money in an interest-bearing account. If the rate of change is proportional to the amount present, the change can be modeled by the expression dy dt equals k times y. Now, being able to read this differential equation is important. You need to understand what this is actually saying. Right here, the dy dt, what is that? Well, that is the change in y with respect to time. So the change in y with respect to time is going to be equal to some constant k times the amount that you currently have. That's what this is saying. It's saying the amount that changes is going to be equal to some basis, some proportion of what you already have, the amount of y. Now, that's what this is. The rate of change is proportional to the amount present. Now, if we want to go and work with this, well, we can actually go ahead and do our uh, separation of variables and all this. Move the y over with the dy. Move the dt over with the k. So now we can actually integrate both sides. And over here, we're going to have the natural log of y, and over here we're going to have k times t, plus of course my c. Remember this c here is the combined c from both sides. We just move both both c's over and combine it into one c. Now we want to solve for y because we need to explicitly express y. So we're going to exponentiate both sides because that will help us to cancel out this natural log here. But if we do that to one side, we have to do it to both sides. So we get e to the natural log of the absolute value of y. Remember the absolute value is there because we can only take the natural log of positive values. We cannot take the natural log of zero and we cannot take the natural log of a negative number. Therefore the absolute value is there. We'll deal with that in just a little bit. And then on the other side, that whole thing here becomes the exponent for the e on that side. That's the only way that we can express these two sides as being equal. So then the e to the natural log of y, the e and the natural log cancel out. So we end up with just the absolute value of y. And we end up with e to the c times kt. Now, Real quick, let me show you how that actually happens. Let's take this, and I'm going to move up here. So we get e to the kt plus c. And we're exp I'm showing you how it's going to get to e to the c times e to the kt. Well, remember our exponent rule for basic variables. If we have x squared times x to the third, we end up with x to the fifth, which is... 2 plus 3. So all we're doing, since we already have a product, or sorry, a, a sum here, we're working this rule backwards. 
So from here, if we have e to the kt plus c, we've actually done this already, but we want to work it backwards. And we that's where we get the e to the kt times e to the c. And I just move that e to the c to the front here because e to the c is just going to be a constant anyway. But that's where this comes from right here. All right, now we can think of this e to the c as a constant, and it can be the either plus or minus, and that's going to take care of our absolute value here. And then the e to the c, we can think of that plus or minus e to the c as some constant a, and then that's going to give us y equals a e to the kt. So this is the equation that that differential equation we started off with would actually come from. Now, if we wanted to find what the or what a actually is, we can start off being y original or y at the beginning, the starting y equals a times e to the k times zero. Well, k to the times zero is just going to be zero. And what's e to the zero? Well, that's one. So we end up having a being equal to y zero. Now you can, you're going to hear this in a lot of different ways. Uh, y original, uh, the original value for y, the beginning value of y. You'll also may hear this as what's called y naught. And what that means, and the word naught is this, N-A-U-G-H-T, naught. That's just a way of saying Y sub zero. That's all that is. Um, so we end up with the equation Y equals the original value for Y times E to the KT. So this is the solution to our original initial value problem. So of course if we had values for the starting y value and some value along the way. We could actually plug this in and find out what k is. k is a constant that's going to be constant throughout the entire problem. So once you solve for the k, the k stays that way through the entire problem. And you can just, once you know what the original y is and what the k is, you can plug in t's and find out what any y along the way is. So that's the purpose for this. So your exponential change equation is y equals y naught or y sub zero e to the kt. Now if the constant k is positive, then the equation represents growth. If k is negative, then the equation is going to represent decay. Growth means that the, the, as time goes on, the y value is going to increase. Of course, decay means that the y value over time is going to decrease. Now, this lecture is going to talk about exponential change formulas and where they come from. Uh, the problems in this section of the book mostly involve using those formulas. There are good examples in the book, which I'm not going to work on and repeat here. We'll work on those in class. All right, one example, though, is continually compounded interest. For instance, if money is invested in a fixed interest account, where the interest is added to the account k times per year, the amount present after t years is this equation right here. Now, this is the value at any time, so the amount at any time t equals the original amount times 1 plus r over k time raised to the kt power. Now, r is the rate, the percentage rate, divided by k, the number of times it's compounded per year. And then the same thing up here, k is the number of times it's compounded per year, and t is the number of years. So r right here, the rate, but it has to be expressed as a decimal. 
So for instance, let's say we have an uh, interest-bearing account and it's giving you 8% uh, APR. Then this would be 0 0.08. Do not put this as 8% or you're going to get really optimistic about the money you'll get and you'll get really disappointed when it doesn't happen. Make sure that that is put in as a decimal. K, once again, the number of times you compound per year, and T, the number of years you leave it in. All right, the more frequently the money is added back, you're going to make a little more money over time. Because if it's, if it's only compounded, let's say, twice a year, that means you're only going to make money on the interest that you gained for the second half of the year. Whereas, if you're making money and it's compounded every month, after that first month, the second month is going to accrue interest, not only at, with the original account you put in, but all the interest that you gained over that first month as well. So you're going to gain a little bit more. Now, it's not going to, it's not going to shock you when you work that second month, uh, and, or when you look at that second month and you earn one penny more or two pennies more. But over time, you're going to gain more money. Now, the best that you can do is if the interest would be added continuously. That is not going to happen in your typical bank account. But there is an equation for it. You could calculate this, and don't worry about writing this down, but this is actually where you're going to let R go to, or sorry, K go to uh, infinity. We won't be able to find this limit until chapter 8, but what you end up with, don't worry about the TI-89, you end up with this thing right here. A equals A naught, or A of the original amount, times E to the RT. You've probably seen this before in pre-cal. Uh, but you saw it as P e to the RT, the PERT formula. And that is the principal, the amount you put in at the beginning, uh, times e to the RT, R still as that percentage in decimal form, T still in years, and A would be the amount at any number, at any number of years that you put in. Now, you've got to make sure that you use the correct formula. Remember, the formula up here minus the limit. Let me get rid of that for just a second here. Oh, wrong one. All right, so if we take that limit out, don't forget this. This is the equation if it is compounded a certain number of times per year. For instance, if it's compounded monthly, then K would be 12. If it's compounded daily, K would be 365. This is the one where it's compounded continuously. Make sure you get these two straight and understand if it just says it's compounded six times a year, you have to use this formula. If it says only, only, only if it says compounded continuously, would you use this formula down here? So make sure you use the right formula, otherwise you're going to get the wrong answer. All right, another way that you can use uh, the decay and the growth formula is with radioactive decay. Uh, the equation for the amount of a radioactive element left after time t is y equals y sub 0 times e to the negative kt. Once again, negative k because this is going to be decay. You're going to lose mass. Part of the reason an element is radioactive is the fact that it's shooting things off. I have to think back, and it's been so long since I've had a chemistry. I think it's electrons that it's shooting off into space, but it's losing mass by putting things off into space and losing mass continuously. So this is what you're going to deal with. That's the equation. Now, this allows the decay constant K to be positive. 
Now, the half-life is the time required for half the material to decay or to be shot off into space or wherever around. Uh, but anyway, it, it goes off into radioactivity. So, for instance, if something has a half-life of two weeks and you start off with five grams, in two weeks you're going to have two and a half grams. The, ha the half-life is the amount of time required for half the material to decay off into nothing. So, if we wanted to calculate a way to find the half-life, we could do this. One half of y sub zero equals y sub zero e to the negative kt. All right, so here's what we have here. We have one half the original weight equals the original weight times e to the negative kt. And what we can do here is we can actually work backwards and find an equation to relate half-life and our k. First thing we can do, of course, we can cancel out our y sub zeros. There's one on both sides. They'll divide out. Then we can take the natural log of both sides. So the natural log of one half equals the natural log of e to the negative kt, which of course means that this side is just going to be negative kt. And we can split this up using our quotient rule for natural logs. Guys, I cannot emphasize enough, if you do not know your natural log properties for quotient rule, property rule, uh, power rule, all those, you really need to go back and look at those. Those are very, very important. They are back in the fur, and I think it's in the first chapter. If it's not the first chapter, it's the P chapter of the book. If you do not know those, you need to go back and look at them. Make sure you know them. So we end up with the natural log of 1, top, minus the natural log of 2, from the bottom. Natural log of 1 is actually 0. So we end up with negative natural log of 2 equals, ne equals kt, negative kt. Then, of course, we can cancel out the negatives. So this gives us our relationship between the half-life, t, and k, our constant. So we can actually solve for whichever one we want to find. If we know k and want to find the half-life, we just divide this equation by, on both sides by k. If we have the half-life and we want to know what k is, we can just divide both sides by the t. So we can actually solve either one of those from this one little equation. Now in this case, we're going to solve for the half-life thinking that we know k, and there is your half-life equation. So the half-life is equal to the natural log of 2 divided by the constant k. All right, now the last thing we're going to look at here is Newton's law of cooling. Espresso is left in a cup. It's going to cool to the temperature of the surrounding air over time. The rate of cooling is actually proportional to the difference in temperature between the liquid and the air. Think about something and this makes sense. If you have a cup of coffee or a cup of espresso or a cup of hot tea or even just plain old hot water and you leave it in a cup. Let's say we have two cups that are exactly the same temperature and we take one and we put it in room temperature, 68 degrees or so, and we take the other one, we put it outside, and the temperature is like 10 degrees. Well, which one's going to cool the fastest? Well, the one outside. Because of the surrounding air being so much colder, it's actually going to let this thing lose its heat faster. So the rate of cooling is always going to be proportional to the difference in the temperature between the liquid and the air that difference in temperature is going to be equal to the rate of change of cooling or proportional to it in some way. So from that, we have this. dt dt, the difference in temperature, or sorry, the change in temperature with respect to time is equal to, and since this is a k, it's going to be a negative k, negative k times 
T minus TS. TS is the surrounding temperature. T is the temperature of the actual thing at that time. All right, and from that, if we solve it, we're going to get this. We're not actually going to work through this, but this is the solution to that differential equation. T minus T surroundings is equal to the original temperature minus the temperature of the surroundings times E to the negative KT. And once again, T sub S is the temperature of the surrounding medium, the air, or whatever. And we're assuming that that's going to be a constant, that it's not something that's rapidly changing up and down. Uh, this is not allowing for wind or anything like that. So this is a controlled situation, but that is what we could come up with for the equation. Now, if you go and you take, a, if you go into engineering, you're going to learn thermodynamics, which is going to include wind and all kinds of things like that. But this is a very basic, simple expression that is the beginnings of thermodynamics and how something loses its uh, temperature. All right, this will be given to you. Don't think you have to remember Newton's law of cooling. It will be given to you if you ever have a problem like this on one, either my test or the AP exam. So don't think you have to memorize this or anything. All right, well, that is all of 6.4. Uh, see you soon.